Now, what we've done this morning is had a look at one of the daily readings, which is Song of Songs, Chapter 2, and uh, it's an absolutely beautiful story. And we've entitled it today, The the Paradise of God. In fact, we could say this is really the subject of the Bible. Let's go to Revelation, Chapter 1. We're sort of going to start, we could really, we'd be best to start in Genesis, but we don't have time to start at Genesis. We're only just going to pick out a few highlights this morning of this subject. But we want to see the most important thing, without doubt, the most important thing we want to have a look at this morning is the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, the world is going to become a beautiful paradise very soon. But what is the greatest thing of of the kingdom? The greatest thing is the love of Jesus Christ. And that is most powerful when it is seen in people, in us. And that's what we're here for today. Now let's have a look at Revelation chapter 1. Now Revelation, of course, is a, a book which contains quite a lot of judgments and, often, and, and uh, some historical records. And we might not think that this book is a book so much of love. But in fact, it is. This is the book that reveals to us the love and the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's how it starts and how it ends. Look at Revelation 1 verse 4. John, to the seven ecclesias which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come. See, there's the purpose of God, isn't it? And from the seven spirits which are before his throne. Now, the spirit, seven spirits is a reference back to the character of the Lord Jesus Christ in Isaiah chapter 11. And verse 5 says, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, one of the big themes of Revelation, and the first begotten of the dead, so he's the first one to rise to immortality, and the prince of the kings of the earth. Now that's what this book is about. It's about the Lord Jesus Christ becoming us. Now look at this little touch that's then added, which is like the pinnacle of this summary that's given here. Unto him that loves us and washed us. Now remember that term, washed us. From our sins in his own blood. Now what a way to finish that little summary. He loves us and he has washed us from our sins. And, now this is the big theme of the book, and has made us kings and priests unto God and his Father, to him be glory and dominion for ever and ever. Amen. So here we have a picture of the fact that the Lord Jesus Christ has an incredible love for his ecclesias. He's loved us and he has washed us. And then Revelation 2 and 3 describe for us the love that Jesus has for all his ecclesias. Now let's look at the just pick out a couple of verses to the first ecclesia only. Because to this ecclesia, the very first one, to Ephesus, is a dramatic one. Because Ephesus is an ecclesia that lost its first love. Jesus is appealing in chapter 1 about the fact that he loves us, but then the first ecclesia he mentions is ecclesia that has lost his first love. Now let's have a look at this. Chapter 2, verse 1. Unto the angel of the ecclesia at Ephesus write, These things saith he that holds the seven stars in his right hand and who walketh in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. And he goes on to say, Look, I know you've been very hard working, you're labouring, you've got rid of the, the apostates in your ecclesia, you've been patient, you've borne the heat of the day, you've laboured, fantastic, but... You've lost your first love. And it's, he says, in fact, it's so bad that this ecclesia, its, its potential was that its lampstand would be taken away. Now, what's the issue with this ecclesia? The issue is love. That all those, he commends them on more than one occasion for their hard work. That is wonderful. But the greatest thing that Jesus is looking for is the love that is behind the hard work we may do in the ecclesia. That's the most important thing, isn't it? The fact that it's the love of Christ that compels us. 
Now, here we have Jesus introducing himself to this ecclesia with this problem by saying he's walking in the midst of the seven lampstands. Now, why would he say that? Well, he says that because there was previously a high priest who walked in in amongst lampstands. It's in Solomon's temple. Solomon's temple, there were ten lampstands. The tabernacle had one. But Solomon's temple, you had a high priest... In chapter 1 of Revelation, you have it depicted a picture of a high priest walking in, amidst, in the midst of lampstands. Now, why would he do that? Well, it's because there was also an angel that walked in the midst of the Garden of Eden. Remember, it says that Adam and Eve looked and they heard walking in the midst of the garden an angel. And here we have a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ walking in the midst of the garden. We know that because the lampstands in the tabernacle and in in Solomon's temple were trees. The lampstand had engraved on them flowers and almonds. They were like a stylized tree. So here, Jesus says, I'm walking amongst the trees or the ecclesia. I can see what's going on. I'm here with you this morning. Just like the angel was in the midst of the Garden of Eden, so Jesus walks in the midst of the trees or the garden here this morning. But this this is highly relevant to the promise given to this ecclesia. Look at verse 7. It says, He that hath an ear, let him hear. little phrase taken from a number of the parables, particularly if you go back, say, to the parable of the sower. Hear what the... Uh, what he says to the seven ecclesias. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. So Jesus says, I'm walking in the midst of the trees, the lampstands, the ecclesias, and if you overcome, you, I will give you to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Jesus is, is like... The lampstand, really, isn't he? The true lampstand in the midst of the ecclesia. They, if they overcame, were promised that they could be a part of the tree of life. They could eat of the tree of life, which would give them immortality, which is in the middle of the paradise of God. Now, this doesn't just mean that the ecclesia will be in a beautiful place of beautiful trees and flowers and gardens in the kingdom, even though that's true. We know that there's so much more to this. And in fact, what is incredibly beautiful about this is that that word paradise is mentioned there. You know, that word paradise, which is, is literally uh, accurately translated, is means a garden, or if you look at Strong, Strong says it's a park or an Eden. That's literally Strong's description of it. It's a park or an Eden. It's, that word is only found twice in the New Testament apart from here. It's found when Paul sees a vision of the third heaven, which he sees beyond the millennium, which is, I think is there to tell us that beyond the millennium, this world will be a beautiful paradise. But we can think of the other place where it's mentioned. It's mentioned on the cross, isn't it? Jesus says, you will be with me in paradise. So Jesus on the cross refers to this, and it's an appeal to the cross, which is the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. But it's also an appeal, I believe, to the whole purpose of God, that we, as the bride of Christ, can be the paradise of God. And so here, in this promise to Ephesus, the very first ecclesia that has lost its first love, we have this picture given of a promise given to all of us here, And the promise being that we can be with Jesus in the kingdom if we regain the love we had at first. And also, by reaching out to others in love today, that is the secret to finding happiness. Isn't that true? The people in the world tell us that, that volunteers, people who give their life for others, that is the secret to true happiness. It's the the secret. Healing other people is the secret for finding happiness ourselves. And remember that statement that was said to Jesus, and it's in Luke. Luke's the only gospel that records this. Said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come 
into your kingdom. Now, there's so much Jesus could have replied about. He could have given all sorts of facts, all sorts of expositions in response. He could hardly get any words out of his mouth at this point. Jesus simply says, yes, I'm going to say this to you today. You will be with me in paradise. And that said everything. There's one other thing he also said on the cross right in those final moments. And he said, I thirst. Now that, while he was, of course, dramatically thirsty, that I believe, we're going to see this in a minute, is a reference to the kingdom of God. He was thirsting for the future. But most of all, he was thirsting to be married to his bride, who is described in scripture as living waters. And while uh, it would be fantastic to go to Revelation 21 and 22, we would no doubt get very much caught up and run out of time if we went to Revelation 21 and 22. But in Revelation 22, we are given, we are told that that's where the tree of life is. And so we know that the paradise of God is described in Revelation 22 because it says that the promise is given to eat of the tree of life in that chapter. It's like an explanation of what's only mentioned very briefly here in Revelation chapter 2. And what Jesus does is he's saying to Ephesus, you can be a part of that beautiful community that is revealed in Revelation 21 and 22. And if you want to know more about that, go to those chapters and find out all about it. But what is fascinating when you put Revelation 21 and 22 together is you find that not only is the kingdom a beautiful place of beautiful trees, but the bride herself is the paradise of God. Because it says that the tree of life is in the midst of the street of the great city, that broad place, of the, right in the middle of the bride of Christ, it depicts using all sorts of symbolic language of the most holy place of the tabernacle, it says right in the middle of that is the paradise of God. And he, Jesus says to the bride, you are a garden. You are the paradise of God. Now, it's amazing because in... Um, If you go to Revelation 21, you'll find that Revelation 21 is based on Solomon building a house for his Egyptian bride, who he called out of spiritual, he called out of Egypt. Jesus Christ, as the latter day Solomon, brings us out of spiritual Egypt. But that, of course, really is very much a subject for another time. But to put it, I suppose, more closer to home, we are like a seed, aren't we? It's like Uh, We are like a body, like good soil, in which God has planted seed. And in 1 Peter chapter 1, it says that the, the seed is like incorruptible seed. It grows from small beginnings until it is fully grown and bears fruit. And so the bride of Christ, through the scripture, is described as the paradise of God because she's the perfect embodiment of that incorruptible seed. She's the final result of that beautiful growth that Jesus has planted from small beginnings. We could go to other scriptures, which also are like Revelation 19, which tell the same story, really, of the marriage of the Lamb. The fact that the marriage of the Lamb is not only in a beautiful garden, but his bride is a beautiful garden. 2 Corinthians 11 says, I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. And Ephesians 5 verse 31, citing Genesis chapter 2, says, For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife, and they two shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the ecclesia. And we have in that chapter of Ephesians chapter 5 about marriage, a reference to the washing of water by the word. Remember what we read in Revelation 1? He has washed us. But it also says in Ephesians 5 that he is preparing a glorious ecclesia, not having any blemish. King James Version says no spot. It literally means no blemish. Some of you might have um, different versions that will say blemish or no flaw. Perfect. She's a perfect bride. In fact, uh, a citation directly from Song of Songs 4 verse 7 there in, in Ephesians chapter 5. So this is the story of the Bible. The story of the Bible is that Jesus Christ is going to marry his bride, all of us, the ecclesia, and that we 
should be bearing fruit today like a strong, healthy tree, bearing fruit that is shown for the healing of others. And Eve's marriage to Adam right at the beginning of time foreshadowed the marriage of the Lamb. And often uh, when you come to the book of Revelation, often many people get uh, quite confused because they say, well, is this literal or is this symbolic? Well, of course, Revelation is the spiritual based on the literal. So when you go to Revelation 21 and 22, you will see highly symbolic language based on a literal situation. So in Ezekiel um, say Ezekiel 47, for instance, you will see a beautiful picture like that of a flowing stream with trees on each side of the river which literally give medicine to the nations for healing. But in Revelation, Revelation develops that and spiritualises it on something that is already literal and says, this is talking about so much more. This is talking about you. You're a tree by the rivers of water for the healing of the nations. Now, isn't that so beautiful when you think of it like that? Now, let's just remember Jesus on the cross. Jesus is on that cross. What's he thinking about? He's got to be thinking about paradise, doesn't he? Because he says it. It's how he responds. It's the one thing he says. Now, think Jesus is on a dead tree, isn't he? He's got incredible thirst. And on his head is a crown of thorns. And he's looking to the future, to a time where there would be living trees, pure water, and no more curse. In fact, that's exactly the language of Revelation 22. It says there shall be no more curse in that context. Isn't that absolutely amazing? And I believe he is longing not just for beautiful water and beautiful trees. He's longing to be married to his bride in that garden. That's why he says, I'm thirsting. I'm thirsting for the living waters. So Jesus' final vision of the kingdom he gives to us when he's in his mortality on the cross, the final vision he gives us is what? It's paradise. The final vision Jesus gives to us in the Bible, in his immortality, is paradise. So here is something that we really need to focus our minds on, isn't it? And it's something that he can't help but just introducing to the very first ecclesia that he mentions. He says, you're going to be with me in paradise. The very first ecclesia gets this promise. Now just think of many, there's language all the way through scripture like this, isn't there? The Garden of Gethsemane. It says that when Jesus had spoken these words, what words were they? They're the words of John 17, his prayer. When he finished the prayer of John 17 for his brethren, he went forth with his disciples over the brook Kedron, over this brook, of water, where there was a garden. And in that garden, Jesus would have been thinking about the fact that sin came into the world in a garden and Jesus overcame sin in a garden. And he had just given a beautiful prayer for his bride, his brothers and sisters, that they might be one with him as God is one with him. When he had spoken these words, he went into that garden. But not only that, Jesus had spoken to his disciples just before he went into the Garden of Gethsemane. He had spoken to his disciples an exhortation about the vine and the branches. And you remember what the context that was in? He says, these things I command you that you love one another. Greater love has no man than this. And he wants us to be like the branches of the vine, which is himself. In other words, the love of Christ that runs through that vine should be running through us. This is what this whole thing is about. The love of Jesus Christ is the greatest power in the world because it becomes powerful when it is seen and runs through the very veins and the very thoughts and the heart of his believers. Now let's go back to one scripture in Isaiah. We've only got, a ch- only got an opportunity here to look at one scripture in Isaiah, and it's Isaiah 51. This subject, in fact, you could probably do a whole series of studies just on this subject in Isaiah, because it starts, it goes all the way through the book of Isaiah. Isaiah 5 is the vineyard, isn't it? It just goes all the way through. 
Now, Isaiah, let's just pick out two verses in Isaiah 51. Every word here is packed with meaning. Verse 2 of Isaiah 51. Look unto Abraham your father and unto Sarah that bear you. For I called him alone and blessed him and increased him. So he introduces Abraham and Sarah. That's very important. Just keep that tucked away in the back of your mind. For Yahweh shall comfort Zion. He will comfort all her waste places. He will make her wilderness like Eden and her desert like the garden of Yahweh. Joy and gladness shall be found therein, thanksgiving and the voice of melody. So when you read, often you read of the garden, you read of lilies, you read of marriage, you read of joy and rejoicing. That's why John the Baptist says, he says when he introduces Jesus, he says, he introduces him as the bridegroom. He says, I am rejoicing because of that. But notice it says, I'll make your wilderness like Eden. Now, think about this. Elijah, when he comes to turn the hearts of the Jewish people back to the fathers and back to the Lord Jesus Christ, it says he will bring them into the wilderness of the people. He'll bring them to Zion, which is a beautiful garden. Jesus started his ministry in a wilderness, didn't he? And he ended it in a garden. Wilderness, garden. We are going through the wilderness of this life now, but we're heading to the garden, the paradise of God. Sarah that bear you. Why is Sarah introduced here? Because Sarah is the mother of spiritual Israel. We know that from Galatians, don't we? Sarah is used as symbolically the mother of spiritual Israel, the new Jerusalem, the new Jerusalem. We sang about that just now. So Sarah is used in this way. And if we were to go back to Genesis, we would see that quite a number of verses, I think it's about eight verses roughly, in chapter 2, describe the river going out of Eden to water the garden. Which is quite interesting to have so many verses in such a tightly packed uh, section of scripture speaking about just water going through a garden. But there's specific reason for that. It's all pointing to the future. Psalm 1. In fact, the Psalms start like this. The very Psalms start by saying, He shall be like a tree, that's the saints, will be like a tree planted by rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. No wonder. No wonder Jesus says, I'm thirsting. For the, Psalm 42 says, I'm thirsting for the living God. Psalm starts off like this. It starts in paradise. It's got the saints in paradise. That's how it all starts. Because the book of Psalms is principally a book about the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now let's go to our daily reading, where we did our, got our daily reading from this morning, and that is Song of Songs. And we'll, we won't go straight to chapter 2, but we're just going to pick out some highlights to show how that this beautiful garden is used to describe the bride of Christ in Song of Songs. And this book is filled with symbols of healing. You read of frankincense and myrrh and aloes all the way through this book. Healing qualities. Now this book actually starts quite dramatically and quite different how we might read any other book. It says, the Song of Songs, which is Solomon's. Song of Songs. Now, why would it be called the Song of Songs? Well, I'll give you an example. King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Song of Songs is actually a Hebraism that means this is the greatest of all the songs. Does anyone anyone know how many songs Solomon actually wrote in his life? It's interesting. It's in 1 Kings chapter 4, it says that Solomon composed 1,005 songs. Now, from what I'm aware, only one of them is in, the, in Scripture, and that is Song of Songs, the greatest song. In fact, it's quite interesting that we sang that song, and I didn't choose it, but it was like uh, Shell was mind-reading, because I almost did ask specifically for it, that come to the living waters, to the mountain, and to the healing stream, to the new Jerusalem, 
Now, that song was actually chosen by young people at a, at a recent camp of about 150 young people. That song, Come to the Mountain, out of about 300 songs and hymns, that was chosen as their favourite song out of a survey of, of, of young people who chose their favourite songs. That came out as number one out of 300, which is interesting. That's the same, and that was just that group of young people. I'm sure a different group would choose maybe a different song. But clearly, their mind, young people were able to grasp hold of that concept of the paradise of God and healing in the kingdom. It meant so much to them. So here we've got a similar principle. This is the greatest song now the greatest of all the songs. But look at this for drama to start with. It says, Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for thy love is better than wine. We're like, wow, that's a, that's a dramatic way to start, and it's not how you'd expect. It says, Because the savour of thy good ointments, thy name is as ointment poured forth, therefore do the virgins love thee. You know, it's actually not that, it's not that strange to start off like that, because there's one other place in Scripture and we won't go there, where the saints go out from the battle of Armageddon and they say to the world, kiss the sun. Kiss him. Now, I've always explained Psalm 2, that's, uh, if you're taking notes, Psalm 2 verse 12 is a description of the saints coming out of the judgments of Armageddon and they go to preach the gospel to the world and the thing that they say to the world is, kiss the sun. And I've always explained that by saying, acknowledge the sun, bow down to the sun, Worship the sun. But when you look at it, it literally means kiss. Why would the saints go from the battle of Armageddon and say to the world, kiss the sun? Is it really strange to say that? I don't think it's strange at all. Because the saints have just been at the marriage of the Lamb, been given immortality to start the kingdom of God. They see the judgments of the world and what else would they say? They don't say, yeah, they do. They warn and say judgment's coming on great Babylon. But they say to the world, kiss the son. Kiss him because his love is better than wine. And Psalm 2 describes the wine press of the wrath of almighty God that comes particularly on Catholic Europe. And you can go through, in fact, Psalm 2 is quoted in Revelation in that context and it's called the wine press of the wrath of God. So the saints just... All they want to do when they leave the marriage of the Lamb and when they see judgments coming on the world is they don't want to kill people. They want to save people. They say, kiss the son, for his love is better than wine. That's what this book is about. It's about showing love and appreciation to the Lord Jesus Christ. And the wine there is used because not only is wine speaking of judgments coming on the world, in other words, Kiss the son, love the son, because his love is better than being a part of the wine press of the wrath of God. But wine represents Jesus himself, outpoured, doesn't it? Look at verse 14 here in chapter 1. Verse 14 says, My beloved is unto me as a cluster of camphire in the vineyards of Engedi. I'm reading from the King James Version. Not necessarily the best version for this book, but... A cluster of camphire literally means, I believe, some of your Bibles may say henna blossom in the vineyards of Engedi. Now, if anyone's been to Engedi, I went to Engedi on a day when it was about 35. Uh, David and Sue were there. I've got a photo of them under a waterfall there at Engedi. It was so hot. It was like no grass, no greenery anywhere except for Engedi. And we're like, oh, Engedi. There's water at Engedi. And you can imagine, no wonder the bride says of her beloved, my beloved in a howling desert wilderness is like a beautiful flower in the ecclesia at Engedi. Because the vineyard, we know scripturally, speaks of the ecclesia, doesn't it? Jesus Christ is the most beautiful of all flowers in the vineyard of Engedi. That's what it's saying. This, the vineyard is the ecclesia. His love is better than wine. And one thing which I'll mention, and this is we're not going to go into this in any detail whatsoever, but is a secret to understanding Song of Songs. And it's, it's often overlooked. Is that a significant amount of the symbology, in fact, I reckon it's almost every couple of verses in Song of Songs, 
A significant amount of symbology in Revelation and Song of Solomon is based on the tabernacle and Solomon's temple. I suppose Solomon's temple was like a, a latter version of the tabernacle in a different way, built by Solomon. And both of these are representations of the Garden of Eden or Paradise Restored. We could go into the detail of that, which, which would go off right off on a tangent. I've heard, I've heard a series of studies a brother did entirely on that subject, entirely on the subject of paradise in the tabernacle and Solomon's temple. It's just absolutely mind-blowing. And all the symbology that's taken from this, a huge amount of this symbology in this book is taken from the tabernacle and Solomon's temple. And you get to Revelation 21, and how is the bride of Christ depicted? As a perfect cube, the most holy place, in the middle of which is the paradise of God. It's just absolutely... Beautiful. Now let's go across, before we look at chapter 2, and even chapter 2 we're going to only pick out a few verses. Let's go to Song of Songs chapter 4 and verse 7. And look, if anyone wants uh, more detail about that, about that, um, the theme of the tabernacle and Song of Songs and even how to interpret, um, interpret this book, I've, I've written a, about a 50-page summary which I'm very happy to give to you if you like. But the vineyard theme and the garden theme all goes all the way through Song of Songs. Now, verse 7 says, Thou art all fair, my love, there is no spot in thee. Or no, NIV, I think, and I think it's ESV says no floor. Other versions say no blemish. The, the bridegroom looks at his bride and he says, You are absolutely perfect. There's not a single blemish in you. Now, that's amazing, isn't it? Because Ephesians 5 says Jesus might present to himself a glorious ecclesia, not having spot or wrinkle. Same, it's just taking from the Septuagint straight into Ephesians chapter 5. But you know that word for spot or flaw, no flaw or no blemish is a specifically hand-picked word from the Old Testament. And it's used constantly, that word translated blemish or no spot or no flaw, is the word that is used for the perfect uh, perfection of the burnt offering, which represents Christ. But it's also used in the context of the Aaronic priests offering the sacrifices. The fact that the Aaronic priests had to be without physical blemish. And these things pointed to Jesus. And here is the Lord Jesus Christ, who is absolutely perfect. And when he brings us into his kingdom by his grace and mercy, he looks to his bride and says, you're absolutely perfect. You're without blemish. You're just like me. And we're like, no, that, that can't be the case. In fact, chapter one of Song of Songs, the bride's just going, no way, I'm just nothing like that. I'm black. I, I'm burnt by the sun. I'm just I'm burnt by the heat of the day. And Jesus says, you are absolutely perfect. You are without blemish. And a similar thing is said in chapter 5, verse 2, where it says, you're like a dove, you're undefiled. Chapter 6, verse 2, it says, you're like a dove, you are undefiled. Chapter 6, verse 9, you are absolutely perfect. Now, this is very powerful, isn't it? Because all of us here feel anything but absolutely perfect. But this is very, very encouraging for us. Now, look at now at chap chapter 4, verse 12. A garden enclosed is my sister, my spouse. A spring shut up, a fountain sealed. Now that's the way the Garden of Eden is described as an enclosed garden. This is a garden specially set apart for the bridegroom and for God. Just like the Garden of Eden was a garden enclosed. It was like a fenced garden is the way it's explained, described. It's a spring shut up. This is a pure bride kept for her husband. Verse 13 says, Thy plants are an orchard of pomegranates with pleasant fruits, camphire and spikenard. Now that word orchard in the King James Version is literally the word uh, in the Hebrew is pardi, which is literally paradise. So if you go to more literal translations of the Bible, you will go to, say, Young's Literal or Rotherham and you will see it's translated, literally they translate it paradise. The bride is a paradise of pomegranates. And remember, pomegranates were around the hem of the high priest's garment. 
And I, I really think when Jesus looks down and he sees them casting lots for his garment at the cross and he sees what depicts someone had produced for him a, a garment that couldn't be torn, it was like a high priest garment, surely his mind would have gone back to the fact that there were pomegranates on the, on the high priest garment. A fruit, a beautiful fruit that represents the saints with a multitude of seeds in them. And this is paradise. In fact, there's only three places in the Old Testament where that word paradise is used. Two other places are... There's one in Ecclesiastes where it talks of Solomon's garden being a paradise. The other one is in Nehemiah where it says that the temple in Jerusalem was built from the king's paradise in Persia where it's a paradise of trees used to be put into Jerusalem. They're very important references. But here we have this very rare concept of the bride being paradise. No wonder Jesus says when he's on the cross, you're going to be with me in paradise. Pleasant fruits, camphire, and that's what we read in chapter 1, verse 4. A cluster of camphire in the vineyard of Engedi. Spikenard. Where have we seen spikenard in the New Testament? Well, there's a place particularly where spikenard is found. And I believe that this woman knew exactly what she was doing. Song of Songs 1 verse 12 says, When the king sits at his table, my spikenard sends forth the sweet smell thereof. Here it says that the bride is characterised as spikenard. She poured out everything of her own house. She understood that Jesus was king and priest. This is powerful, this concept of spikenard, because it says that Mary anointed his feet, but didn't just anoint his feet, which John 12 says. Mark 14 says she anointed also his head. She recognised from the Aaronic priesthood, from Psalm 33, that Jesus was high priest, so she anointed his head. From Song of Songs, chapter 1, verse 12, she recognised he was king and anointed his feet. The proof of that, and we haven't got time to turn that up, is that the very next day after that incredibly beautiful event, where she gave all the wealth of her house in love, it says that Jesus is the king of Israel who's going to sit at his table. Firstly, at the Last Supper, and secondly, in the kingdom of God. No wonder the last chapter of Song of Songs says, in chapter 8, verse 7, Many waters cannot quench love, neither can floods drown it. If a man offered love for all the wealth of his house, he would be utterly despised. If you were to give up everything in your life, absolutely everything, for the love of Jesus Christ, people would despise that. They would say, you're crazy, you're you're irrational. This is what this woman did. She understood exactly what she was doing. And there's also an earlier event, of course, as well. But then it says here in chapter 4, verse 14, Spikenard and saffron, calamus and cinnamon, with all trees of frankincense, myrrh and aloes. Now, myrrh was given, wasn't it, to to Jesus when he was born? It was there at the cross and it was there in his burial. Myrrh and aloes and all the chief spices. A fountain of gardens, a well of living waters and streams from Lebanon. And streams from Lebanon are mentioned because the streams from Mount Hermon in Lebanon represented in the Old Testament the pure bride of Christ. That's why Lebanon is used so often in this book. Because Lebanon represents the pure mountain water, not just that, but the fact that also the trees from Lebanon were used to build the temple in Jerusalem. She's a fountain of gardens, a well of living waters. Can you think of where Jesus mentioned that? What an amazing thing. When you think, of where did Jesus mention a well of living waters? He says to a woman who he says, uh, go and get your husband. She says, oh, I don't have any husband. And, and, and Jesus says, yeah, that's right. But why would he say, go and get your husband? Jesus explains in chapter 7 of John, he says, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Because Jesus wanted that woman, the woman of Samaria, to appreciate that he was her spiritual husband. 
Where else could he be referring to but Song of Songs chapter 4? There's no specific scripture that he's, he's quoting. But here we have a person who is a fountain of gardens, a well of living waters. Jesus wants the woman of Samaria to be that well of living waters, to be in the kingdom, to be a part of his bride. Now let's look at chapter 2 and we'll just pick out a few verses. This is the daily reading today, the, 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 the one we read this morning. And chapter 2, we will read... Um, Well, let's read a few verses at the beginning. I am the rose of Sharon and the lily of the valleys. As the lily among thorns, so is my love among the daughters. Now, you know, lilies are mentioned very rarely in the Old Testament. This is just an incredible thing. Lilies are only mentioned, they're mentioned 15 times in the Old Testament. Eight times out of 15 are in Song of Songs. So the majority of times is in Song of Songs. Four times in Solomon's temple. So there's one of the references back to Solomon's temple. Twice in the Psalms. Now, if you're going to mention lilies in the Psalms, where would you have them? Well, one is Psalm 45 as the title. The Shoshanim means a song of lilies. And Psalm 69, which is a, a, a psalm of the cross. And there's one other place which we'll mention in a minute. And then it says, As the apple tree among the trees of the wood, so is my beloved among the sons. I sat down under his shadow with great delight and his fruit was sweet to my taste. He brought me into the banqueting house and his banner over me was love. And here we have a beautiful description here of the bride saying, look, I'm the rose of the valleys. I'm just a a normal flower at the bottom of the valleys. The rose of Sharon uh, literally means the plain. In other words, she's just a, a common, I mean, we think of rose as incredibly beautiful, but this is more of a common flower. And he says, the, the bridegroom says, yeah, you, but you're a lily among thorns. In other words, you are especially beautiful. In his view, she's entirely different. We know that thorns represent the curse, the very thing that's mentioned in Revelation 22. Jesus had the crown of thorns on his head. The lilies, very specially chosen. Psalm 45, Psalm 69. Hosea 14 verse 4 is the final place lilies are mentioned. What an amazing place that is. We'll see that in just a minute. The apple tree. Well, here the bride is described as taking shelter under his shadow. He's a beautiful fruit tree. Song of Songs chapter 8 verse 5 says he raised her up under the apple tree. And here we have this picture of Jesus marrying his bride the ecclesia, the ecclesia sitting under his shadow with great delight. Now, there's one other place in scripture where this is beautifully used. If you want to read a more uh, detailed exposition of this, brother L.G. Sargent, in his book on the gospel of the Son of God, deals with this in more detail. It's in Hosea 14. God marrying his bride, Israel. Look at Look at it. I will love them freely. I will be as the Jew unto Israel. He shall grow as the lily. Final place. Psalm 45, Psalm 69, Song of Songs, uh, Solomon's Temple. You're going to grow as a lily, the bride of Christ. There it is. He shall cast forth his roots as Lebanon. His branches shall spread and the beauty shall be as the olive tree and smell as Lebanon. They shall dwell under his shadow. They that dwell under his shadow shall return. They shall revive as the corn and grow as the vine. It's the ecclesia, isn't it? The scent thereof shall be as the wine of Lebanon. And you see how the prophet describes a a perfect, forgiven bride that is considered pure in the kingdom of God, Hosea 14. And he uses the language of chapter 2 to describe it. Absolutely amazing. And it says he will allure her and bring her into the wilderness and speak tenderly to her. That's the work of Elijah with the Jewish people. But here we have on the table before us the bread and the wine, which is the Lord Jesus Christ speaking tenderly to us. His love is better than what we have even here this morning. Here is just a symbol. Look at verse Song of Songs 2 verse 
8. The voice of my beloved, behold, he comes leaping upon the mountains, skipping upon the hills. <laughs> we know that scripture, don't we? In, in Isaiah 52, it says, How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of him that brings tidings. It's because it's not the message that's the power. It's the person that brings the message that's the power. The power in Jesus' life was not so much the message he brought, it's his feet. It's the person that brought the message. That's a big lesson for us there in, in preaching the gospel, isn't it? My beloved is like a roe or a young heart. Behold, he standeth behind our wall. He looketh forth at the windows, showing himself through the lattice. And we have this, this picture here given of this garden now. And showing himself forth, literally in the Hebrew, means to flourish like a green tree. Normally elsewhere in the New Old Testament it's translated flourish in relation to flowers and trees. He's flourishing at the windows. My beloved spake and said unto me, Rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. For lo, winter is past, and the rain is over and gone. The flowers appear on the earth, and the time of singing is come. And the fig tree in verse 13 puts forth its green figs. There's Israel. The vines with tender grapes give forth a good smell. It's the preaching of the truth. The ecclesia, isn't it? And what a beautiful picture we're given here of the kingdom of God. But the most beautiful one is what we're going to end on now. And that is a couple of verses at the beginning of chapter 3. Because here's a woman, Mary Magdalene, who lived all of these principles in her life. She's described here in Song of Songs chapter 3 and verse 1. By night on my bed, I sought him whom my soul loveth. I sought him, but I found him not. In the Garden of Eden, God placed Adam in a garden to dress it. Adam was the first gardener. Jesus on the cross has his side pierced. He goes into a deep sleep for three days. Jesus is resurrected and finds himself in a garden and is presented to a woman who represents us. She, she was healed of a terrible illness, maybe mental illness, maybe. She is healed by the Lord Jesus Christ. She is the one that appreciates him so much. She is there to receive Christ to represent all of us here this morning as the paradise of God. See, she searches for him whom her soul loves. She rises and goes. She can't find him. But when the watchmen find her, and she says, where is he? Verse 3, did you see him whom my soul loves? It was but a little that I passed from them, and I found him whom my soul loveth. I held him and would not let him go until I had brought him into my mother's house. Who's the mother of spiritual Jerusalem? That's Sarah, isn't it? The mother's house is the ecclesia. And unto the chamber of her that conceived me. And after Sarah's death, Isaac married Rebekah and is comforted. And he brought her into his mother's house, his mother's tent. No wonder Isaiah 51 says, remember Sarah when you remember the Garden of Eden restored. And so, brothers and sisters, as we come to the emblems on the table this morning, let us be like these wonderful women who appreciated the love of Jesus so much. No wonder Mary would have been thinking of verses like, my soul waits for the Lord more than they that watch for the morning. And who does Mary think Jesus is at the garden? She thinks he's the gardener. And Jesus says, don't cling on to me, for I haven't yet gone to my father. In other words, the marriage of the lamb can't happen yet. Here is the bride, spiritually speaking, looking for his groom. A beautiful example of who all of us must be. And that is, brothers and sisters, the beautiful paradise of God. And so when we take the emblems this morning now, brothers and sisters, let us think more than anything else of the love of the Lord Jesus Christ and the fact that his love is better than wine. Thank you.